APIs, 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 APIs. I love APIs. APIs, when you're starting out with Bubble, seem kind of scary because it seems to be part of this like wider web technology space that's not no code, right? It's, we're leaving the confines of Bubble, which is nice and safe and friendly, and we're going out into the, into the world, into the web. Um, but APIs, actually not that complicated. APIs are essentially just providing a standardized way to have one or more services connect with one another, share information. Um, so I wanted to start with a high level example. We've got our app over here. All right, here's our app. And this app, right, that we're trying to build, this is an app that's going to let us share TV show recommendations with our friends, right? Where we watch a new show and we think, oh my God, this is the best show ever and we wanna share it with our friends and our shared friends can maybe um, rate, you know, the shows that we recommend, thumbs them up, that kind of thing, right? So some kind of interactive social platform. Now the problem in building an app like this is that we don't have a database, presumably, ready to go full of TV shows, which is what we would need, right, for this app to work because we would wanna, you know, allow our users to kind of search for TV shows and have our, you know, users kind of like vote, upvote certain TV shows. So we'd need to populate the site with all of these TV shows for our users to choose from in the beginning, okay? now. One way around this is not to rely on our own database, okay? Because yeah, that's gonna require a lot of work to populate that database with all of these TV shows up front. What we could instead do is rely on a third party service, right? Third party service. Who just so happens to have a database full of TV shows. Now, if only there was a way for our app to make a friendly request to this third party service, for the third party service to get data from its database, right? This is the database for this third party service. And for us to get that data, okay? For us to essentially pull that data out of their database rather than our database. They're giving us access to their database full of TV shows, okay? That's what an API does. It allows us to get access to a third party service, okay? And what often that will look like is retrieving data from a third party service, from a third party database like this. So how do we actually interact with an API like this? So Let's use the analogy of ordering pizza from Domino's to understand how an API works. This is you, right? You're hungry, you want pizza. Over here is Domino's, right? This is Domino's, this big, this big service, okay? Inside of here is where all the pizzas get made, right? This is, this is what they do inside of this, this proverbial black box, okay? And what Domino's does is it exposes various services to you that you can interact with, okay? One of the most obvious ones is creating an order, okay? creating an order, okay? But you might also have, for example, let's say that you don't really know what pizzas that are on offer, okay? You could call them up and you could ask them to, to list the pizzas that they have available, right? What pizzas do you have available? Or what pizzas, what vegetarian pizzas do you have available? That kind of thing. You might also call them up and wanna check, you know, where's the status of my delivery? How far away is it? So you could go, you know, check status, check the, check the delivery status. It's another thing that Domino's might allow you to do, right? You might also, after ordering your pizza, realize, oh, I forgot to ask for wedges, or I just realized that I ordered the thin crust and I'm really a thick crust kind of guy. So um, what I wanna do is call them up and update, update my order, okay? 
So these are all things that you can call up Domino's and do, right? These are like, they're expecting these kind of requests from users. So these are the services that they provide. Okay, now what you do as the user is of course you call up Domino's, right? You call up Domino's and you make a request for one of these services, okay? But you do so in a very predefined way, okay? You don't call up to order some pizzas and start talking about the weather and start talking about that your house plants are in desperate need of sunlight or you know all this random stuff that that's not the input that Domino's needs that's not the input that Domino's wants okay Domino's is expecting you to tell them what pizzas that you want okay so when you make this request here to create an order you do so with some predefined inputs that Domino's has specified okay you would pass to them you know, the actual pizzas that you want to order. You would pass to them your delivery address, right? You would pass this information to Domino's, they might ask for it, okay? But this is information that goes with your request, okay? And the other part of this is that each of these services, you are telling Domino's kind of what to do you're giving it like a verb, like create an order or tell me, you know, list out all the pizzas that you have, okay? And in the API world, okay, there's only a certain amount of these verbs, a certain amount of these types of requests, okay, what, what we call methods, okay? And this one is called a post, a post request, okay? That is where you are telling Domino's to go and take some action on your behalf, okay? There's other types too. If you are going to ask for them to tell you what pizzas they have on offer, okay? And there might be certain inputs that you can provide here, right? Like the, the type of pizza, okay? This would act like a search constraint, right? They would receive the search constraint and they wouldn't tell you all the pizzas that they have. They would only tell you the vegetarian pizzas, right? Or the pizzas that are on special or whatever your, um, whatever search constraint that you sent. Okay, this situation here where you are just asking them to give you some information, right? So Domino's is just gonna go into their proverbial database, okay, and pull out the pizzas that meet your search constraints and then send that information back to you. Okay, so it's just a basic retrieval of data. We call that, we call that a get type request. It's a get method. Yeah, these are the verbs. These are the ways that you can interact with their service. You can either post information to them, in which case they're gonna take that information, go into their Domino's machine, right? You don't know how the pizza is made, but you know that at the end of that process, there's gonna be an output, right? That's what I forgot to draw here, is the output, which of course is gonna be a pizza. And in this case, it's gonna be a list of pizzas that's sent back to you. Okay, and there's some other types of, of requests here too, right? This one here, check status, that would be another get request because you're just retrieving information, okay? But this update order, there's other verbs that we can use in this case, okay? Commonly, the APIs will also use a post request for this, a post type method, okay? But you can also use something called a put request or a patch request, which are kind of what they sound like. Put some more information into your system. So I call them up and I tell them, you know, I ordered the thin crust and I want thick. So I want you to, I want you to kind of replace the order that you've got with this new order that I'm telling you. Okay. Or patch, which is essentially the same thing, but it's more, you know, change this one specific piece of information. So when you go out and you start playing around with APIs, okay, the API will tell you how it wants you to interact with it, okay? What methods it accepts. It will tell you what services it provides, what inputs you need to provide, okay? And how it expects you to interact with it, okay? So you don't need to memorize all of this stuff, stuff up front, but this is sort of just laying the foundation here. This is understanding kind of at a high level how an API works. Hey guys, so full disclaimer, the video you're watching right now, it's from my bubble course, Think It, Build It. If you wanna join the course, see more videos like that, Fantastic. If not, 
just enjoy this video. Happy bubbling. The other thing I would layer in here just before we start getting into practically speaking how we connect with an API is that there are several high level categories of APIs, okay? And what we're talking about here is what's called a REST API, okay? Which is the most common type of API that you're gonna interact out there on the web with. So it's the one that we're gonna cover here in this course, but just know there are other types so you may encounter those and you'll have to do some more learning at that point as to exactly how they work. But at a high level, right, what all of these APIs are doing is allowing two different services, in our silly little example here, a user and Domino's Pizza to interact, okay? And once we have kind of an, a, an interaction like this set up, okay, we would call that an integration. We would say that these two services are now integrated. So let's go back now to our TV show recommendation system, okay? And let's see, okay, in this example, instead of Domino's, right, this is going to be a service called TV Maze. So this is TV Maze. And what we're looking at here is the documentation for how TV Maze works. Now what TV Maze is, is they have a database full of TV shows that we can access. And it's not just you know, the TV shows themselves, but it's all kinds of information on those TV shows. You know, it's some images for those TV shows, it's their IMDB rating, the number of seasons that they ran for, the date that, this, that the show ended, like all of this kind of data that would be really difficult for us to populate ourselves in our own app. We can just rely on the TV Maze API in order to access all of that data, right? So this web page here, the API documentation is going to tell us what services TV Maze exposes to us and how we are required to interact with them. Okay, and the services that this API provides are called endpoints. Okay, the endpoint is where you send the request. It's essentially like a little door in the side of the of the API, okay, and you go through this door when you want to interact with, in the case of Domino's, when you want to interact with orders, like when you want to create and update a new order, you go through the order door. When you want to see all, all of the pizzas that are available, or all the vegetarian pizzas that are available, when you want to retrieve or get that information, then you go through the pizzas door, okay? So you might have an orders door, a pizzas door, Pizzas and orders are two different things, right, within Domino's Pizza, two different kind of categories of objects. And in the API world, we call those resources, different resources that the API provides and that we can interact with. So you might go through the same door to create and update an order. You might use the same endpoint, but what's different then is the type of request, right? You might post to that endpoint to create a new order, you might patch to that door, to that endpoint, in order to update an order. So there are different ways that you can interact with those endpoints, but the simple way of understanding this is that those endpoints all represent basically different services that the API provides, different ways that you can interact with it. And so if we scroll and look here at the TV Maze documentation, we can see that one of these first endpoints is called the show search or the search endpoint, okay? Which says that this is basically just gonna let us search through all of the shows in their database, right? Okay, and it's giving us here a URL. Now you can see it's only part of a URL, okay? That's the end part of the URL, the end point, right? Okay, kind of the base, the core of the API is this here, this this uh, api.tvmaze.com, okay? And then everything else is the endpoint. Like if you look at other, if you look at other endpoints here, you can see that, there we go, the endpoint is different, but that, that base URL is the same, okay? So that's the way in which we actually interact with APIs, is just by pinging different URLs, right? Pinging different addresses on the web. So, how do we actually interact with these endpoints? What we can do, right, we don't even need to go into our bubble app yet. If I go down to this show single search, I'm gonna grab this example 
URL that they've sent me, this example endpoint, and I'm gonna paste it into my browser, okay? Because my browser, my browser can actually call this endpoint. It can do a get request to this endpoint, okay? So I'm gonna hit enter and we see we're getting this information, okay? This is the output of that endpoint. Okay, this is what the API is sending back to my browser, in this case, to the client. Okay, and then we can do whatever we want with this information. Okay, so you can see that it's sort of hard to make sense of here, but we can roughly see, yeah, it's giving us some information about a show. But what I actually wanna do, I'm just gonna copy all of this, and I'm just gonna go down into a different program here called Visual Studio Code, okay, which is just a, play, just a, a code editor, basically. And the only reason that I'm putting this in here is because it's gonna let us look at it in a slightly more human-friendly way, okay? So this is that same information, it's just represented now in a different way, okay? What we are looking at here is a JSON object, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And all that is, is a common structure, almost like a common language for how to represent data, okay? So that different services, as long as they speak JSON, right, they can send information between one another. So in this case, we're using JSON, well, TV Maze is using JSON to represent information about a show, okay? So let's break it down a little bit. This curly brace up here, this opening curly brace, has a corresponding closing curly brace, okay? And everything in between, everything in between is the show, the show object, okay? The show thing. And then within the object, right, what do we have? We've got what looks like attributes, properties of the show, right? The name, the type, the language that it's in. Does this kind of format look familiar? It should, because this is really exactly how we're representing our data objects in Bubble, right? A data object in Bubble, remember, it's nothing more than a package of fields, a package of data. Right, it just holds attributes for that thing. And then in the aggregate, we call that collection of fields and information an object. It's the same thing here. All of these are fields, right? This is the ID field with a number value. This is the URL field with a text value, another text value. Okay, we've got a date value down here. We've also got something like this, where we have, this is the genres field, the genres attribute, and it actually has an opening and closing square bracket. In JSON, that indicates that this is a list of things, or in the wider programming world, an array. This is an array of data. So that's just a list in Bubble. So we've got here a list of texts, essentially, right? We've got drama and romance. So those are a list of genres stored on this show object. And what's so awesome about the structure and obviously how closely it mimics what we're already used to is that our bubble app can make sense of it. Okay, our bubble app could actually work with this object, okay? We can represent this data in our bubble app. We can do stuff with it, we can manipulate it, we can represent it, okay? So let's actually jump in now. Let's jump into bubble. Let's find a way, instead of using our browser to call this, okay, and retrieve this information, let's feed this data into our bubble app, okay? And then let's see if we can represent it on the screen to our users. So in Bubble, to connect with an API, we need to use a plugin. A plugin called the API Connector, okay? So this isn't some like weird hacky way of connecting with APIs, this is the Bubble official way, okay? It just requires that you install the API Connector plugin, which is a plugin that they themselves have created to allow our app to integrate, or to connect with other services, to connect with APIs. So once we've got it open, 
we want to click here to add another API. Okay, and this is where we add the name of the third party service itself, right? So in our case, this is this is TV Maze, right? This is TV Maze. Okay. Now there are some settings like this authentication setting here that we are not going to worry about right now, but we are going to cover over the course of the next few videos. So we're going to leave authentication as it is. We're going to ignore shared headings and shared parameters. Okay, we're going to come down to this section here, which is where we see API call. Okay, so this is where we actually configure the endpoint for the, the API. Okay, so if I expand this, okay, the endpoint that we want to connect to, right, the service that we are interacting with on TV Maze is going to be this show single search, this show single search here, okay? So we will call this show single search, okay, for simplicity, okay? We're going to use it as data and we'll get into what that means in a little bit. We're going to sit here for data type what type of output are we expecting from the API? Okay, what information are they going to be sending back to us? Okay, which is defined by the API. If we go into the documentation, it's telling us up here that it returns JSON. It returns JSON. So we can comfortably leave this as JSON. But there are other types here too. And depending on the API that you are connecting with, right, you might want to use one of these. But JSON is the most common. That's the one that we're dealing with here. Okay, then we have the method, right, the way that we are interacting with this endpoint. What we talked about before, get, post, put, patch, delete, we haven't mentioned. And this is important because we could actually interact with the same endpoint using two different methods, right? If you think back to our Domino's Pizza example, Imagine that we have the orders endpoint, okay? If you do a post request to that endpoint, then that might create a new order, okay? But you could also do a get request to that same endpoint, that same URL, and that would give you an update on your order, okay? That would give you information about your current orders, okay? So same endpoint, but two different methods for two different things. Now in our case, this show single search, okay, we can only interact with this using the get method, okay, we're retrieving information. We're not posting any information to TV Maze through this endpoint, okay. So we can leave this as get, that's what we want to do. And then in here, this is where we actually paste the address for that endpoint, okay. So that would be this whole section here, okay, this whole section here. So the, the root the root domain here, okay, which TV Maze has given us up here. This is the root URL. And then the endpoint itself, okay, which is this part here. It's everything after that first forward slash. So it's giving us here an example, an example URL. So let's let's copy that one just as we did before. And let's use that one to test with, just to see if we can make a rudimentary connection, a rudimentary integration. So I'm gonna paste that in here, okay? Now again, we're not gonna get into the details of headers and parameters here, right here, but we will over the course of the next few videos. But this is all we need now, okay? All we're trying to do is replicate, right, pasting that URL in our browser. That's all we're trying to replicate here in Bubble, okay? So now that we've got this set up, we're going to initialize the call, okay? Initializing the call is gonna ask our Bubble app to make this get request, okay? So we're gonna initialize it, and now we're getting this view here. Now I get a dopamine hit every time that I see this screen because it means that we have successfully called this endpoint. We've successfully communicated with the API. Okay, because in a lot of cases, you might have an error. You might not have configured something properly and you won't get the screen, you'll get an error. Okay, but this means things that are connected properly. Now I want us to ignore all of this section right here and I'm just gonna scroll down to the bottom and click show raw data, okay? Now this is the raw output that we received from the API. So we did a get request to get a a show, a single show, right? Using that single search endpoint. 
TV Maze has returned that single search object to us, that single show to us, and this is how it's represented in that JSON format that we talked about before, right? There's the, the start of the object and then all of this information, all of these fields and their values, right? They belong to a single object, a single show. So since we're receiving things in this JSON format, okay, our bubble app can pass it, meaning that they can make sense of it. They can interpret this JSON object in the language or the structure of our bubble objects, okay, of data in our bubble application. And that's what bubble is doing up here. For every attribute for the show that was returned, okay, bubble is assigning it a, a value, okay? So these are all of the fields on the show. So there's the ID field. Bubble is making a guess that that's text, okay? We could also change it. We could say, actually, I want it to be a number. There's the URL, which Bubble is guessing as text, okay? The name of the show, which Bubble is guessing as text. So Bubble is just automatically assigning these fields a certain value, okay? And we can also decide, hey, some of these might not be relevant for us and we can ignore them, okay? And that means that we're not gonna use them in our Bubble app at all. Okay, we're not gonna have access to them in our bubble app. Now, obviously here, we're just getting the data for that show girls, okay? If I just click save here, and I add a different value here, and then I reinitialize this call, now we're getting a different show returned, right? The Sopranos, okay? So we're getting a different show object returned here, okay? So we're able to interact with this endpoint, okay? How do we actually now do something with this data in our application? How do we have access to it in our app? So let's say that we wanna display the show that we received from the API out on a page to our users. How do we do that? So when I click save here, okay, what I'm doing is I'm initializing this endpoint in a way that is gonna let us do exactly that. It's gonna let us have access to the value of this endpoint. It's gonna let us call this endpoint from anywhere in our application, okay? So just to show you that, I've got a very simple page here just with a group in it, okay? And this group is where we're gonna show the TV show that we just received, that Sopranos TV show, okay? So as a type of content, if I look in here, you'll see, ah, We've got a new value here, show single search, okay? Not a very intuitive name. Might be better for us to just go like this, okay? So what you're receiving via this show single search method, okay? And in my bubble app now, it will still say the old version because I haven't reinitialized it. So whenever we make changes in the API connector, we should reinitialize. And now you'll see that that new name is being reflected, okay? So we're displaying here a object that we've received from that endpoint. This is not an object, this is not a data type that we've defined ourselves in our bubble database, okay? The structure of this object comes from the API. It comes from that third party service, okay? And we're just having access to it. We're just pulling in those values, that information, and then representing it in our bubble app. So we've got the type of content here set to a show as defined by the API. And now we're gonna say, okay, how do we actually get it, right? Where do we get it from? So the data source, we're gonna select this get data from external API, okay? Get data from external API. And now we choose what's the provider of that API. And the API provider, okay, there's only one because we've only got one, okay? So we could have multiple endpoints or multiple API services in general defined within that API connector and then we would have more options here, but we've only got one. So we're just gonna choose that single one, okay? So by setting this up, what we are doing is getting this group here, this group TV show to make the API call to TV Maze when the page is loaded, okay? Because remember this data source section, this data source 
expression, that will fire when the page loads. So when the page loads now in Bubble, this group is going to do that API call from our app to TV Maze, asking it to do a single search for a show. It's going to receive in the way that we've initialized it, right, a Sopranos show. That's what we're expecting at least. Okay, so we're testing this out with some with a search constraint that we have full control over. So in theory now, right, I've got this text living inside of this, this group TV show. I could pull through the parent group show, right, and now display a field from that show, like for example, the name. I've also got an image. I could do the same thing, insert dynamic data. I'm gonna grab the parent group show. And right here, we have an image medium. So I'm gonna display that, that image medium. Okay, let's load the page now. Let's see what happens. So if I go preview, boom, look at that. So we are, pulling information now from a completely different service to our own. Some third party API, some database living somewhere else on the web, we have just successfully asked it to send us information and it has. We're pulling information from somewhere else now. So if I go into this group main, you can see like here's, the, here's all that data, right? This is, the, this is the show living inside of this group right? And then the data source, here's that API connection here. Here's that API connection. Here's what it's returning. Okay. So that's super awesome. Very, very cool. But right now we're just showing the Sopranos, right? We're, we've successfully asked the API to send us back the Sopranos every single time. But that's not that useful, right? We want our users to be able to dynamically search for particular shows and have them returned here by the API, okay? So we wanna feed some dynamic value from our app to the API and have the API process that and send us back some data. So for example, right, if I put an input on the page here, and I will put it inside of my group main here and I will just make it not fixed width. So this is gonna be our input show name, okay? We wanna feed the value of this input into, into this data source, okay? So how do we do that? We need to go back to our plugins tab, back to our API connector and where we have this Q equals Sopranos, okay, this here we basically want to be defined by the user dynamically. So to do that, we add some square brackets, we give the name for what it is, let's say show name, and that's essentially creating now a query parameter, okay, what in an API world we would call this a query string. It's nothing more than a URL parameter. So here's the key, right? Here's the name of the URL parameter. And then the value is the equivalent of the Sopranos. It's what is the name of the show that we wanna retrieve data for. And so since we made some changes here, I'm just going to um, make sure that I am gonna reinitialize this call. So we need to have some value in here. So I'm gonna type Sopranos. I'm gonna reinitialize. Okay, so that's gonna update now this API connection throughout the entire app. So I'm gonna click save, and I am going to just remove that value as well. And now within this data source, we have access to that show name input. Okay, so now we could literally just type Sopranos, and if we reload the page, we'll get exactly the same data, right? We'll get exactly the same data. Or I could type, you know, another Great show at the moment, Succession. And if I reload the page, now we're getting the values for Succession, okay? Or, right, or instead of typing something static, predictably, I point it to that 
inputs value. So we're feeding the data from the input into the API call. Okay, and when I, re when I load the page, okay, we've actually got an error down here, okay? And that error will be because we are not feeding any query string to the API right now. It can't handle this show name query being empty, okay? Because it doesn't know what to search for. So let's give it something. Let's try Sopranos. There we go. Let's try another show I'm watching right now, Ozark. So we are now able to dynamically populate this container, this group, based on an input that the user provides and data living in some database somewhere else on the web. So this is a super powerful concept here, right? Our bubble apps have just, just leveled up, right? They've just gone super saiyan. We can now have them do all kinds of things that they wouldn't be able to do natively, okay? Just by now leveraging the data and the, the, lo the logic, the services that other applications out on the web have. So a couple last things before we sign off here. Let's expand our foundation for APIs here a little bit more, okay? What I've been doing here is I have been populating this group using a data source, okay? So I've been pulling data from that API, right? But we can also push data into this group, okay? We can also use a workflow to populate this group, which might be useful if, for example, I have a button in here, if I have a button called search, let's say, and let's move it up a little bit, okay? And this button, when it is clicked, is going to populate this group, okay? So it's not gonna do anything by default, it's only gonna react to a button click. So for us to set that up, we need to go back to our API connector and now instead of use as data, we want to use this as an action, okay? We want to use this as an action, okay? And that's going to allow us now to call this API from a workflow rather than from the data source of an element, a data source of our group, okay? Now that I've changed this, I need to reinitialize it. And just to show you, I will probably get an error here because I'm not defining any value for that show name. Here we go, yeah, see, I'm getting an error. Even if I tick this allow blank, so that's a, a bubble side restriction, bubble won't let you make this call if there is anything empty in here. We're allowing bubble to make the call, but we'll probably still get an error, yeah, because TV maze doesn't want to have an empty parameter here, okay? So we won't allow that to be blank, let's just type something so that we can initialize it, cool. So now we're getting the data that we need. So we'll save that. I can now, I could leave this in. I could leave this in um, and I will, I will leave it in and you can see what the impact of that is. So we've set this up now as an action. Now let's go back to our design tab, our search button, start at workflow. Okay. We want to add an action here that populates that TV show container. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down to plugins. Okay, this gives us access to any endpoints that we have configured to be an action type, right? Which we have just done, rather than a data, uh, a data type um, request. So I'm going to choose that, and now we're getting the same, you know, the same kind of way of interacting with the API. It's giving us now access to any dynamic fields that we can feed into the endpoint. And so this is what we're seeing, right? That show name just as before, only now it's pre-populated with Sopranos. And that's because I left this value in here. I could actually remove that and it will be empty here as well. Okay, we just have to remember that we have to build some logic into our app to not allow this show name value to be blank. Okay, which we can kind of do with this button by you know, only letting users click the button if the input is not empty. So here I'm going to point the, the value for this show name path to the value of that input on the page, right? 
So we're making that call now to the API. It's returning some data, and now we need to decide what we want to do with that data. So, right, we want to display it in that group. So we're going to go element actions, display data. The element that we want to display it in is this group TV show. And the data to display is going to be the output of that API call, right? Which is coming in raw as a JSON object, as a show, right? Formatted as JSON. And Bubble is interpreting it as this, if I go back to this, this container here, it's interpreting it as a new type of thing called a show single search, right? It gives that thing the same name as the API call itself. So in bubble terms, we are now dealing with it as a show type object, but it's coming in raw as a JSON object. So bubble is, is interpreting it, is transforming it into a show type thing, which we can then manipulate, right? We can then do stuff with it, including display it inside of a container formatted to hold onto a show object. So that's what we're doing here, displaying the result of step one, the result of that API call. And now, if I test this out, let me try again with Ozark, click search, boom, there we go, look at that. If I chuck something else, another show that I like, The Boys. Cool, so that is now you know, how we're interacting with the API using workflows. So using the API call as an action rather than as a data, okay. Okay, now last thing is let's connect with a different endpoint here, this show search, not show single search, so that we are receiving a collection of TV shows rather than just a single TV show. Okay, so let's see how that works, right? Dealing with a list of things returned from the API. So I want to come back here to my API connector. I'll collapse this, we've already set this up, so that's all good. And I'm going to add another call, a new call here, okay? And this is going to be our show search. So I might call this show multiple search, just to differentiate it. So show multiple search versus a single search. So we know that this is going to return a list of things. Okay, so I will use the example endpoint here. We know how to set this up, so I'll add it in. And then let's just from the get-go, we'll set this up the proper way. So we'll add a parameter here, we'll call it show name, okay? And we don't want it to be, oh, and we don't want it to be private because we want to be able to interact with this input via our design tab, right? We want to have this be filled dynamically, but we'll just add something here for now, like girls, right? Like what it was, okay? And then if we initialize this, cool. What we're actually getting in this case, if we go down to show raw data, is we are getting a list of shows, okay? And how do I know this? We're starting the whole JSON object here with a square bracket. Let me just copy all of this copy all of this and paste it into Visual Studio Code here, just so we can see it a bit clearer. You'll see the whole payload, right, what we're calling the payload, the, the parcel of data that was returned from the API, it starts with a square bracket and it ends with a square bracket, okay? That denotes the start and end of an array right, which we've already briefly covered. In bubble terms, the start and end of a list. So everything in between is a list of things. In our case, a list of shows. Inside of the, that list, right, here is one show. Here is another show. Here is another show, okay? So that show there is denoting the start of that show object, that show thing, okay? And this score, okay, this is just some metadata about that entry in the list, okay? This is actually corresponding, if you look at the documentation, this is actually corresponding to the accuracy of the search, how well this object fits the search parameter, the search constraint, and it's ordering them 
okay, by best fit. So the higher the score, right, the more accurate the result, the more accurate the, the, the show based on the search constraint. It fits the search constraint the best, right? So it's just like Google putting the most accurate entries at the top of the list when you do a Google search, same, same thing here, okay? So the most important thing to get our heads around here is just the fact that this whole JSON object is containing a list of things. So when we interpret it in our bubble app, we also need to interpret it as a list of things, a list of shows, okay? So if we come back to our API connector here, and if I click save, we'll keep all of these fields as Bubble has interpreted them. If I click save, right? right, I should now be able to put this inside of a repeating group and populate that repeating group with the list of shows that we receive, right? So let's try it out. I'm going to, I'm going to just make a couple of small changes here to the group. I'm gonna get rid of this minimum width, I am going to grab a repeating group here. Okay, and I'm just gonna make some small adjustments here to my repeating group. I don't want a fixed number of columns, but I do want kind of a minimum width for each column. Let me just bring it up on the page a little bit and get rid of this fixed width. Make sure that I'm setting a minimum height here of whatever this minimum height is. Right now it's at 372, so we'll just call it, so we'll just go 400 by 400. And then this guy we want to put inside. There we go, we want to put him inside. And we might just center them as well. And for good measure, I'll just shorten my, my input a little bit as well uh, and put the search button over on the left-hand side. So now on this repeating group, okay, I am going to add a type of content which now corresponds to that new API call, right? Show multiple search. So that, as far as Bubble is concerned, is a new object, okay? It's a new type of thing, okay? Specifically, it's a list of things. So I am going to get data from an external API as before and choose that multiple search option, that multiple search option, okay? And now for each of these, I'm gonna configure that to be a show multiple search and grab the current cells show, the current cells show. And now I'll just connect up these inputs as well. Parent groups shows show name. Parent group shows image. Okay. And the show, the path, okay, the, the dynamic query for the name will connect that back up with input show names value as well. Okay. So we don't need this button anymore. Right, we're just gonna do this as we were before by pulling data in. So if I reload this, you see, look, by default, we're actually pulling in all of these girls. Um, that's because I'm still populating this query parameter with girls by default. So I will remove that. And now it should be empty on page load unless I start typing in, let's say girls. Boom, look at that. The boys, if I type in something more general like money, right, you can see all of this stuff coming up. So we now have this kind of crudely represented in terms of the UI, but in terms of functionality, we've got something really powerful here. We're allowing our users to basically filter this repeating group of shows that lives on some other server somewhere else on the web.
okay? So that's the real basics of APIs. That's like the foundation here, okay? But we can go a little bit deeper. Right now, we're interacting with an API that is just like completely open for us to use, completely free. But most of the APIs that you're gonna use are not gonna be like this. They are going to require you to essentially log in to authenticate yourself. So we're gonna get into what that means, how that works in the next video.